So maybe we should get started. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome Fred Chong. He's a professor at University of Chicago. Um, so he's been looking at quantum computing for as long as I know as a grad student, uh, for more than 20 years, I believe. Um, but now he's leading a, a high profile expeditions program at the uh, University of Chicago involving many leading scientists in quantum computing. Um, yeah, so we are very excited to have him. Um, without much ad further ado, please uh, take over, Fred. Great. Uh, I'm honored to be here. Thanks for inviting me. I should impress this, but hopefully it will share just fine. Um, so if you feel free to ask questions by unmuting yourself, you can also type your questions on the chat window, and then I'll try to pose it to Fred uh, if that's more convenient for you. Great. So uh, as Satish mentioned, um, I've actually been in this quantum computation space for about 20 years now. And um, uh, I, I'd say, you know, and we'll see today that it's, it's, it's a really exciting time for quantum computing because we have real machines for the first time, really, uh, of non-trivial size. But what I'm gonna talk about today is maybe a little different than most quantum talks that you might hear. Uh, I'm gonna talk about a computer systems view of quantum computing and how that's important to really get the most efficiency out of the machines that we have today and will in the near future. And we're really going to look at essentially building software and systems that go beyond the abstraction of a typical quantum machine and really look at the physics of those machines to uh, optimize the, the computation. Now, this uh, work is part of, uh, as Satish mentioned, an NSF expedition in computing called EPIC. Uh, and uh, we have a team of people which uh, reflects the sort of vertically integrated work that we do from uh, theorists at MIT, including Aram Harrow, Peter Shore, and Ike Tuan, to computer scientists at uh, University of Chicago, and uh, experimentalists at Princeton, Duke, and uh, Chicago. So let me just start out with, you know, why as a computer scientist and computer architect, I find quantum computation so exciting uh, over all these years. And really the main thing is that it's the only technology that we know that can fundamentally change what is computable, right? Uh, it's the only technology that can give us, uh, you know, a doubling or an exponential scaling of computation potentially, uh, depending upon the algorithm with the number of devices that we have. And this will give us the ability to solve currently intractable problems in chemistry, simulation, and optimization, uh, to list a few examples, which could lead to you know, nice benefits in things like better materials, photovoltaics, even things like nitrogen, understanding nitrogen fixation better. Um, as an architect, uh, it's also interesting to think about quantum computing because as Moore's law and Dennard scaling slow down, uh, we have you know, a new technology that gives us some forms of scaling, perhaps in specialized domains. And also, the study of quantum computing has led to more insights in classical computing. Uh, previously, we've seen insights in chemistry, physics, and cryptography. And as we move forward, it's really sort of a healthy competition between classical algorithms and quantum algorithms uh, in the computing space. So why, are, why now? You know, why are things so exciting right now? Well. What we have now is, as I mentioned, for the first time, machines of non-trivial size that have been built in um, primarily in industry. And as John Preskill would say, uh, who is you know, an early proponent of quantum computing from Caltech, you know, now is a privileged time in, his, in the history of science and technology. And he's coined this term uh, that we call NISC, which is noisy intermediate scale quantum. And that this both talks about sort of the potential of, of where we are right now and the challenge, right? The potential is that we're now at uh, intermediate scale, which means that we're at a non-trivial scale where we can actually compute things that can't be simulated classically, or, or at least at the moment are very difficult to simulate classically. Um, and so there's definitely new science that's going to happen, right? Uh, but it's also, that these machines are noisy, right? If we had machines that were 53 perfect quantum bits, right? We would already be computing lots of really exciting things. 
But the challenge is that these are noisy qubits and we have to deal with that noise and those errors and try to mitigate them and do something useful even in the presence of those challenges. And a lot of what I'll talk about today is really about uh, addressing that challenge. So another way to look at this is we look at the machines as they have progressed over time. And here what I've shown is uh, the number of physical quantum bits in a machine on the x-axis on a log scale and the average error on a two qubit operation on these machines also on a log scale and um, as we move from the left bottom corner to the right uh, the machines are improving right and in fact the machines have been improving exponentially over time right? which is great but there's still a huge gap between the algorithms we want to run and the machines that we have, right? And really the goal of you know, our project and other projects in this space is to close this gap. Right? And uh, the EPIC project has, has this specific stated goal of developing algorithms, software, and hardware, essentially co-designing them to close the gap between algorithms devices by two to three orders of magnitude. And this two to three orders of magnitude translates to about 10 to 20 years of hardware progress. Now this sounds ambitious, but in fact, uh, it's very attainable. In fact, in the last three years uh, of our project, we've actually come up with many optimizations, uh, each about two to 10 X in uh, increase in efficiency and up to about 10,000 X. Now, I should be a little more precise, actually. By efficiency, what I mean is either using fewer qubits for computation, uh, using fewer gates or operations for a computation, or tolerating more error for a computation, right? So those are the three things that essentially make up that gap that we're trying to close. Um, and in fact, you know, from these optimizations, uh, we've had about 70 or so papers, uh, five of which received best paper, six patents, a startup we spun out, and we're really pushing this idea of quantum computer systems as a discipline. In fact, uh, we just came out with a textbook uh, synthesis lecture, and this spring we'll have an edX course on this, uh, in using this material. And in fact, the techniques that I'll talk about today, many of them have already been integrated into Twitter, uh, Google's, uh, uh, sort of software systems. All right. Now, just to give you an idea of the kinds of things that we do, uh, here's a, a, a sort of a, a pretty long list of selected things, um, which range from uh, modifying the algorithms to, uh, for example, in this case, use fewer trials or measurements, uh, changing the way that we compile algorithms to down to instead of gates, but actually to analog pulses, uh, adaptively mapping uh, and scheduling um, so, uh, algorithms for the variation in machines, uh, going from binary to ternary logic, uh, looking at two and a half D architectures and various other kinds of uh, noise mitigations um, in, the, in the system. And you can see on the right, the outcomes are, uh, you know, fairly substantial. And uh, the idea is combining these outcomes will give us that two to three orders of magnitude, and in some cases, even up to five orders of magnitude in efficiency. And we also have fairly substantial efforts in sort of creating uh, an ecosystem to promote this idea of quantum computer systems research uh, from uh, industry uh, relations to uh, open source software and tutorials to our textbook to even uh, sort of K-12 uh, efforts. So what I'm gonna to do today in our sort of somewhat limited time is give you six examples of how a computer systems approach can give us this increased efficiency and close this gap between algorithms and machines. So that's gonna go by pretty fast, so feel free to stop me and ask any questions. All right, so let's start, right? So one of the first things that we did is we looked at how to map uh, algorithms to machines um, 
you know, is sort of a typical mapping and scheduling problem, but doing it in a way that's much more adaptive than typical, right? So in fact, quantum hardware varies day, day by day, right? And these uh, uh, graphs that I'm gonna show here come from IBM's uh, publicly available machines. And what they do is they actually calibrate the data, uh, they calibrate the machines uh, every day, actually twice a day, and they publish that data uh, once a day. So if you look at the top right here, uh, what I show here is on the x-axis different days and on the y-axis uh, a measure of how good a qubit is, okay? where higher is better. And what you can see is that day-to-day uh, -day, the quality of a qubit varies and even the worst qubit is not always the same one in a particular machine, although mostly it's that blue qubit. Right? Also, if you look at uh, the operations between the different qubits, right? Um, in this case, uh, something called a controlled knot between uh, different qubits, you can see different pairs also vary in their gate error rate where higher is worse, right? Day to day, right? And also the worst pair is not always the same. So this variation, it turns out, is very important. And what we can do, you know, is we can target not only right, a specific machine, but a specific day of conditions for that machine right? and compile right before we run. So here on the left, I have an example of a quantum circuit. If you haven't seen one before, uh, each of these uh, lines represents a qubit and time goes from left to right, right? So the P0 to P3 are different qubits. The boxes X and H are single qubit operations. They, they perform an operation on particular qubit. And the uh, dark circles that with the uh, little plus sign, uh, those are what are called a controlled knot. That's a two qubit operation where the dot is the control and the plus is a knot operation on the, uh, the qubit that it's sitting on. Okay, so we take these gates and we map them to a machine. And you can see two examples on the right, right? That's a machine in sort of a ladder topology. Uh, it's a real IBM machine. So on the top, you can see that IBM software maps the uh, qubits P0 to P3. So they're all close together, right? Uh, so it's minimizing communication. However, it's unaware of sort of the poor qubits, right? The bad qubits, which we've shown in uh, sort of gray circles and the bad links or bad operations between qubits, which are in the, uh, the red axis and happens to have uh, selected some of those. Um, now, what we do is uh, we use uh, two flows, either heuristics or some P-solver, to actually place those qubits close together, but yet avoiding the red X's and the gray circles, right? Pretty simple approach, works really well. It's actually up to about 28X better in reliability, about 3X uh, on average. Um, this approach works so well that it's now integrated into IBM's Qiskit software. Um, and in fact, it has basically changed how the industry compiles to their machines, right? Fred, is it trivial to know which qubits are bad and which connections are bad? Um, they run a calibration routine and it's pretty expensive, right? Um, it's actually probably not so hard to know what's bad. What they do is they run a calibration routine to try to make them as good as they can, right, to adjust for the errors. Um, to characterize the errors. Uh, and that, that's why they only run the calibration routine once or twice a day because it's expensive. Uh, there are some questions about, is it more dynamic than that? You know, should we be running some form of calibration more often? You know, those are somewhat open issues, but this gets sort of, you know, this is the most of the benefit, right? When you do something like this once a day. All right, so this, this was great. Um, but let's go a little uh, further in breaking our abstraction here, right? Um, now, in this next example, we're going to look at um, compiling not to this typical gate model, which looks like essentially assemb machine assembly instructions, but we're actually going to compile directly to the underlying analog control pulses of the machine. Okay. What does this mean, right? 
So once again, on the left, we take a small part of a quantum circuit, similar to the example I showed before. And in the top flow, which is this conventional flow, uh, that would be translated into these quantum gates, which look like uh, assembly language instructions. And then what happens is each one of those assembly language instructions gets translated into a pulse sequence to implement that uh, on either, for example, a superconducting or trapped ion machine. On a superconducting machine, it's microwave pulses. On a trapped ion machine, it's laser pulses. And that looks like this picture uh, on the top right. Now, instead, what we're going to do is we're going to take that function, consider it a, you know, a three or four input, um, you know, however many qubits it is, uh, function, and it, it's, it's an input and an output. So it's a start state and an end state. And we're actually going to use a gradient descent solver to find the shortest uh, analog solution to get from the start state to the end state. And what we get is actually this picture on the bottom right, which you can see is considerably shorter and simpler. And it ends up that this is about 2 to 10x faster than the traditional approach. And you can think of this on uh, this picture on the right as uh, the conventional approach would get go from the start state to the end state through this series of somewhat indirect gray arrows. Right? Whereas our approach goes directly from the start to the end. Um, so it has a lot of potential. But there's a challenge. <clears throat> it could take hours or even a day to compile a program before it can run it because this uh, gradient ascent solver is quite expensive and the dimensionality of the problem can be quite high. Um, in fact, we have to do this for blocks of a program, not the entire program because it's intractable to do this for the entire program. So, you know, if we only have to compile once and then run the program many times, that's fine. But it turns out this compilation time is a serious problem for an important class of algorithms that alternate between classical computation in the outer loop and quantum computation as a kernel in the inner loop, right? So if you have to iterate an algorithm, uh, a kernel, say, thousands or even millions of times, if you had, uh, and the input, so this, this compilation is input dependent. If the input changes to that kernel, you have to recompile each time. Taking hours each time over millions of iterations is not a particularly uh, attractive solution. So, um, it turns out that uh, looking at this problem, we're going to come up with an approach of partial compilation. And the particular problem is actually is important. It's um, something called a variational quantum algorithm. And what we have here is uh, you know, qu quantum and classical hardware working together, where the classical hardware controls the quantum hardware. right? And uh, a good example is, for example, um, looking at finding the lowest energy state of a particular molecular compound. Uh, looking at which electron configurations give you the lowest energy state. And the way that's done in this kind of algorithm is you have a, an outer loop that essentially guesses those electron positions and an inner loop where the quantum machine can very quickly evaluate what the energy is of that configuration. So in this particular example, uh, which we call a variational quantum eigensolver, it turns out that we can find blocks of, of code or blocks of the circuit where only a small parameter changes. And it turns out it's, it's this uh, rotational angle parameter, which you see as theta one and theta two and theta three here. And so most of the computation is fixed. So we can do a partial compilation and then essentially fix it up based upon this uh, changing theta. And the result is we can still maintain about a two X speed up in the implementation of the program uh, with these uh, optimized pulses is about 10 to 80 times faster than previous methods, right? And the key to this entire body of work, right, was to break the abstraction of compiling to machine instructions and target pulses directly. And this has been a really exciting line of research that, uh, you know, will continue and I think is, is going to be an industry trend also targeting pulses. Sorry, could I ask a question? Sure. Can you say something about the complexity of the compilation process uh, with the number of qubits? I would expect it to be exponential. Um, I mean, it's a heuristic, right? It's a gradient descent. Uh, at some level, 
you get to the point where it's not just uh, complexity, but gradient, the gradient ascent solver will get lost if there are too many dimensions in the, in the space, right? And so we restrict our approach to you know, three or four qubits at a time in the program, uh, little blocks. And can you give me an idea of what kind of problems I can solve with two, to three to four qubits? I just don't have any intuition. Uh, you can't solve a lot of problems. We, we, we string together these blocks into a program of many qubits, right? So basically, we, a lot of our work is actually finding, uh, uh, being clever about picking which subblocks, to which things to group together in the circuit and compile this way, and then we string them all together. Does that make sense? Yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah, sure. Yeah, great, great question, since I'm doing this uh, in very quick summary, uh, definitely ask clarifying questions. Okay, so now we're gonna move to a, another technique, which is a little different. This is a little bit more like quantum memory management. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to try to save qubits by reusing them. Right? A typical quantum program would just allocate more and more qubits as you need them. And it turns out, actually, quantum programs use a lot of temporary qubits, which we call ancilla. And you know, in a, in a, in a classical program, you would reuse those bits right, after you're done with them in a particular computation. But there's an interesting trade-off here in that in quantum programs, uh, qubits are essentially entangled with the result, and you have to uncompute or undo that relationship. So there's a, a, a big computational cost to this notion of quantum memory management or garbage collection, essentially. So what we're going to look at is the cost of this uncompute and whether it's worthwhile. It's, and uh, it's really interesting. It's actually very integrated with the notion of mapping and scheduling quantum computations. So there's an interesting uh, option, uh, sort of decision that we have to make. And it comes from this, if we look at a function here on the left, this is uh, a quantum circuit, which has a nested circuit in it, right? So it, uh, this U of G is the outer circuit. Inside, there's a, a module, like in your code, it would essentially be a subroutine or a function. and you know, every time you call this, you're going to um, this U of G, you're going to also call this U of F, right? And there are two ways to, of going about how we uh, try to reuse some of the qubits. So the red qubits are the ones that are temporary qubits and we might reuse. So one way that we can uh, do this is what we call the lazy way. We can uncompute this on the right there. Uh, you can see the mirrored version of the function. And when we get to those little blue circles on the right, we get to use those qubits again, right? So now we've uncomputed it. And so during those red lines are when those qubits are unavailable. But we can do the uh, more expensive thing, which is we can get some of those red lines, those red qubits back earlier if we more aggressively uncompute. So we take that u of f minus one, uh, on the left there, and we can do that early and get that qubit back. But a crazy thing happens. Um, we have to recompute it later in order to uncompute the parent function, right? So there's like a recompute of the uncompute. And so there's quite a lot more computation in the top option than the bottom option, but you get more qubits back early. So there's a trade-off between being lazy and eager. So it turns out that, of course, a hybrid approach of deciding when to be lazy or eager is important. And also, it turns out deciding when to uncompute based upon uh, how close the qubits are to where you need them is also important. And what happens is that surprisingly, our so we designed this algorithm for future fault tolerant quantum computers where we have a lot of qubits you know, you know, when we have maybe thousands or you know, even millions of qubits. Um, so, and, and, that, and when gates are um, much more reliable. So we expected that this mechanism would work when we could afford to do a lot of computation to do uncompute. Un it turns out that this approach works great for uh, NIST machines, which was really surprising 
it, it actually is 50% more accurate or more reliable to use this approach than not on uh, machines that are slightly better than current machines, slightly bigger. Um, so it turns out that even though we have to invest more gates that cause errors, it's cheaper to uncompute sometimes than to find a free qubit somewhere in the machine and move it to where you need it. So on these IBM machines, it turns out when you uh, need to move something, it's done through a swap gate. So here, if, if I need to go from a gate or qubit 50 to qubit 24, so at qubit 24, I need a free qubit. Um, and, and so I move it, a free qubit from 50 to 24, all those red arrows are actually swap gates. Alternatively, let's say that I could do some uncomputation and make qubit 24 uh, free or usable again, um, which is that sort of little green circle uh, recycle arrow there, right? Um, it turns out that sometimes that is much cheaper than communication, which was you know, really surprising to us, actually. And in future machines, when gates become more, more inexpensive, it actually can be 10x better in uh, reliability. So this, this was an interesting result that actually we had been working with for quite some time before we worked it out. Um, you know, we knew that some form of quantum memory, memory management would be useful. All right, so I'm gonna move on. So a fourth example is an even sort of greater uh, departure from our normal abstraction. So we're actually gonna look at ternary computation instead of binary computation. So qubits instead of qubits, and it turns out that another good use of uh, having an extra space in our machine is is once again these temporary bits or ancilla. So what we're going to do is instead of allocating new qubits to be temporary bits, we're going to sort of borrow the third state in a in a um, in a device. So. The idea of ternary logic, of course, is not new. It's been around classically for quite some time. But it actually tends to make quite a lot more sense in the quantum case. So in classical machines, right, you basically have a finite amount of signal, right, between zero and half a volt, let's say. And then you break that up into, say, two logic levels, and you have noise margins. But if you have three logic levels, you're basically squeezing your noise margins, right? And so you have less, you're breaking up the same amount of signal into more logic levels. But in a quantum machine, it actually turns out that we use these energy levels and normally we just use the, the lowest two energy levels and we ignore the higher ones. And so there's actually more signal to be had, right? And so there's some useful uh, you know, sort of physical property there that we can get three levels. Now there is a disadvantage that the third level is a little more prone to noise or error, and that uh, we have to evaluate in this work. And so uh, really sort of skipping forward to the results, it turns out that if we use this third level and we cleverly design our circuits to exploit the third level, um, we get about a 70x reduction in the number of qubits that we need in some circuits. Um, there's been quite a lot of interest from different hardware platforms uh, and vendors you know, not surprisingly, people want to get the most out of the devices they build and, uh, you know, sort of using an extra state and giving us more uh, information to work with in computation is nice. Uh, and we used uh, IBM's pulse level interface to actually do a Qtrit experiment. And on the right here, what you see is we're taking a single qubit and we're moving it between three different states in a simple sort of uh, three state counter, right? And we're able to, uh, essentially fool the machine into using three states since the machine isn't really designed for it. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's exciting that, you know, fundamentally the technologies are, uh, are, are able to do this three state manipulation, but it, um, the machine, the systems still need to be a little bit more optimized. For doing it. Okay. One more. This is uh, some of our most recent work, actually. Um, and this is interesting because what we're going to do here is we're going to look at some, you know, some newer technology. Um, 
which is uh, essentially quantum memory built from a, a resonant cavity sitting on what's uh, typically used as a qubit called a transpon. And it turns out that this gives us sort of a two and a half D uh, topology or architecture, which it, it turns out is very good for the leading error correction code, which is called the surface code. Um, and so on the top left here is uh, an example of a surface code. Okay? A surface code is a code which uh, you can see that's four tiles here. So each of these tiles is a, is a logical qubit. It's designed to work on a 2D near neighbor topology. It uses only near neighbor operations. And uh, it's very uh, efficient. It's very good at, uh, at accommodating high levels of air with a small number of physical qubits. So these surface code tiles normally look like this. They're on the left. They're uh, built in a big 2D array. And on the right, uh, we're going to use this new technology where we have a 2D array at the top. And each one of those uh, qubits, which is what we call a transmon, has a resonant cavity uh, hanging off of it. And each cavity essentially is, a, is like a 10-bit memory, right? So the, the cavity resonates uh, in different modes, and each mode can store a qubit. And it turns out you get random access to all of those modes, and you can do some nice things like you can uh, have a la two layers of, uh, of these logical qubits, and you can make them interact in parallel. Um, so this is the first attempt to essentially virtualize uh, error-corrected logical qubits right, on a machine. And uh, it turns out it, 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 it works great. Um, there's some cost. You're essentially serializing some of the computation. But uh, it turns out that these cavities can be quite fast. And so, and, and that coupled with this ability to do random access and essentially uh, have less communication, it makes this an extremely efficient architecture. Um, and um, one of the things is this thing called a transversal CNOT, which is this parallel you know, two qubit operation that's logical between two logical qubits. And it's about 6x faster than how a uh, surface code would normally do uh, a two qubit gate. And there's uh, this sort of cool thing we can do. We can actually uh, squeeze this topology and double some of the qubits. It serializes the computation by a factor of two, but also gives us essentially a factor of two in compression of the architecture. And so when we look at you know, this uh, architecture versus uh, a baseline, which is only 2D, uh, we can see that uh, something called the threshold is very similar. There's a slight de uh, decrease in the threshold, right? Um, which uh, is, but, but it's basically uh, similar. So we're comparing the picture on the right, the graph on the right, which is the baseline, versus various options of our system. And what you're seeing here is a very typical quantum computing plot. Um, what you have on the bottom is the error rate on a device becoming uh, worse and worse right, from the left to the right. And that, uh, that's a physical error rate. And the logical error rate getting uh, better right, from uh, on the y-axis. And what you see here is each of these error correction codes right, uh, will get worse. Right? So each of these colors is a different strength error correction. Right? So D equals three is the weakest code. D equals 11 is the strongest code. It means that you have a bigger and bigger um, uh, 2D tile. Right? So you're encoding in more physical qubits. And the threshold is when these lines cross. And what it basically means is that by increasing the code distance, you can make the system better, right? So you've, you've now essentially, you're winning more because you have more computation to do, to do error correction. Uh, so that's more gates. 
but the correction is strong enough that you actually gain reliability. And so that's this point at which the technology has to be better than this threshold in order for your error correction code to buy you something. Yes. Francesca is joining us from CMU, where she is a senior PhD student. And the topic for the day is going to be hash tables. Before we get started, a value. Hi. Another you, question. Or is that another talk. That's, that's, could you mute yourself? I did not come up with a really cool buckets for hash tables. hashing. Like, you need some sort of functionality to find what that particular code can you mute someone? Seth, could you mute yourself? Okay, I think we're good. Right. Yeah. Sorry okay, about that. Great. So, so the, the, yeah, that's a little bit more detailed than some of our some of the other things I did, but this essentially shows you that uh, we can make the system much more compact, about 10x more compact, 20x actually, with uh, a little bit of cost in how much, how reliable the devices would be. So, so the exciting part of this is not just the compression and the speed up, but actually this bottom line here, which is we could build a prototype with just 10 or 11 transmons and nine cavities, which could simulate, which could implement 10 logical qubits, right? So this architecture and this scheme actually gives us a target of a physical machine prototype that would be very exciting and very near term to build, um, which would give us, you know, a, uh, a fault tolerant quantum machine with 10 qubits that would last a really long time. Oops. Go back. All right. So this is my last example. Now this example, I also quite like this example. Um, this is an example of how Physics-aware software can make it so that you can build a simpler machine, which has the performance or reliability of a much more complex machine. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at uh, this phenomenon of crosstalk, which is when you have two gates near each other causes errors. And we're going to try to tune the machine to avoid this kind of phenomenon. So here's a picture of an IBM machine. And these two black uh, sort of rectangles are two quantum gates, two two qubit gates that you want to do in parallel. If you do these two gates in parallel, because they're right next to each other and have this uh, link between one and six uh, next to each other, you will get error that's 10x worse than if you did not do them in parallel, right? And so that's crosstalk caused by resonance between the qubits as you're trying to do these two operations. So that's bad, and we want to avoid that. Now, there are a few ways to avoid crosstalk. And this picture, this plot chart, gives us uh, some of the design options. Okay, So uh, in this work, what we're going to look at is having qubits that are implemented that can change their resonant frequency. It's a, what we call a tunable qubit. But we're going to have the links between the qubits are going to be fixed. Okay, so they're not going to be tunable. Essentially, they'll always uh, be working. Now, there are some other options. The IBM machine is fixed qubit and fixed coupler. Okay, so nothing is tunable. It's simpler to build. Okay? But you know, we can see that roughly speaking, it's about 13x worse um, if you don't have. Uh, tunable qubits. Now, the Google machine is both tunable qubit and tunable coupler and has quite good crosstalk cap uh, so avoidance capability because you can essentially turn off the link between two gates that you don't want to cr have crosstalk, right? You can disconnect them by, by turning off the uh, coupler. Um, but it turns out if you're smart about how you assign frequencies, you can avoid that. And this is important because a tunable coupler is a basically as hard to build as a qubit. Okay, so a coupler, a fixed coupler is basically a capacitor. A tunable coupler is just basically a qubit. And so one thing you might notice is that many years ago, what, three years ago, Google announced something like a 79 qubit machine. And then 
Two years later, they announced a 53 qubit machine. And, every, and you're thinking, how did they go from 79 to 53, right? Well, that 53 qubit machine is really something like a 150 qubit machine because every link in that machine is actually essentially a qubit, right, in a 2D mesh. So uh, their previous machine didn't have tunable couplers. Their new machine has tunable couplers and performs quite well. Okay, so the big sort of conclusion from this work is if we're smart, we'll be able to build a simpler machine that has good crosstalk uh, avoidance. And the way we're going to do that is first in the top row, we're going to assign frequencies to the qubits that are essentially uh, disjoint with the neighbors, right? And so that's simple, right? We do a simple graph coloring and we assign frequencies such that no two qubits sitting next to each other uh, have the same frequency. And then we do something a little bit harder. We take the computation and we look at every epoch of a computation in the dependency graph. So essentially we look at all the parallel operations that have to happen in a given time step. And we build a crosstalk graph, which essentially looks at all the potential crosstalk that can happen. And then we, we do graph coloring again to assign frequency so we avoid crosstalk between those. Now what's important is we have to dynamically tune the, uh, the couplers, or not the couplers, we have to dynamically choose what the interaction frequencies are to implement gates for each application, for each time step for a machine. Okay? So it has to be very tailored. But if we do that, we can avoid crosstalk. And here in this picture, our baseline is the blue line, which is sort of the IBM-like machine. Uh, and we are, uh, our best case is the red line. You can see it outperforms the blue line uh, on average by about 13x. And then you can think of the more complex Google-like machine as the green line. Uh, here, higher is better. This is uh, program success rate. And you can see that uh, the red lines are comparable to the green line, but our machine is arguably much simpler to build. So that's the conclusion of this crosstalk mitigation work. And what I want to do is sort of wrap up with this idea that if you look at the software flow of the crosstalk mitigation work, it was really about building a very vertically integrated domain specific software stack that takes us from the program level to very, you know, a physics aware view of the hardware level, right? And this is really uh, the notion of quantum computer systems design that we're trying to, uh, to advocate and, and proliferate here which is you, you need to have you know, designers that are uh, trained in you know, both system software architecture and, uh, and also um, devices at some level and be able to do this uh, sort of vertically integrated uh, optimization. And you know, really, this is analogous to trends in classical systems, right? Um, there's really a renaissance of classical systems of vertically integrated or domain specific software stacks. Now, uh, uh, one more thing I want to bring up, let me see, do I have time? Yes, is just a, an open problem, right? I'm not gonna go into too much detail here, but uh, one thing that we're, you know, I've talked mostly about optimization and efficiency. One thing that I haven't talked a lot about, which is also a big part of our expedition is verification. Right? And really, the big question is, how do I know if my quantum program is correct you know, when I run it on a machine? We have this sort of ridiculous bootstrapping problem, right? Uh, of, like a forklift on a forklift, right? We have quantum hardware that we'll be building that will be barely reliable, right? We're really pushing the limits of technology to scale these things. And then we'll have quantum software that will be untested at scale because by definition, we're trying to build quantum machines that can't be simulated by classical machines. And so we can't really do our sort of traditional tricks of software testing and software test vectors, right? So we really need a new methodology. Now, we've had some work, uh, interesting work in uh, essentially quantum assertions, which is uh, essentially tests in program while we're executing on a machine, uh, which is interesting, but costs gates, 
uh, a really nice, uh, you know, match here would be to use more formal methods, right? So, you know, typically I think as an industry, we're a little lazy about formal methods in the sense that we, we figure it's easier just to do testing. But in this case, we really can't do testing very well. And so formal methods to verify, uh, you know, our, our programs and our compilation are, are really important. Um, and really we've made progress mostly on verifying the compilation, right? The classical compiler that transforms the quantum program, we can verify that at some level. Um, fundamentally, there's a really, uh, you know, tough question here is can we verify the correctness of quantum algorithms or quantum programs that we implement themselves? And, you know, fundamentally we can't verify any property in tractable time uh, that's too close to the computation itself, right? Because if we do that, then we've actually just disproven that that algorithm has any exponential advantage over classical. Right? And the fundamental question is, can we find properties of programs that are useful for checking correctness that aren't too close to the actual result of that program? Right? And that's really unknown right now. Uh, I mean, we have some ideas, but you know, that's a really interesting problem and actually has implications in addition to the practical implications of how do we check programs, it has implications for um, you know, what is the space of, of quantum supremacy or quantum advantage, you know, which, which, which algorithms are going to be useful. Okay, so uh, I'm going to not go over this example in detail, um, but we do have some work where we did some SMT based verification of a compiler, in fact, the IBM compiler. And the result was that we actually found four bugs in the Qiskit compiler, which is an open source compiler that has, uh, you know, uh, a community contributions, right? And so we've actually built a uh, automated method to try to verify those contributions. And so this is pretty exciting. But I will say that what I've talked about most of today, which is optimization for efficiency and breaking abstraction, is in somewhat indirect uh, opposition to verification, right? So this uh, system that we built relies upon the modularity of the IBM compiler to uh, verify each layer, right, in a tractable way. And so as we break abstraction and break layers, we're going to make it harder to verify them. In fact, for example, we don't really know how to verify pulse level implementations of, of of programs, right, uh, without actually simulating the program or simulating the machinery. So Fred, can I ask a quick question? So yeah. you haven't uh, talked much about what type of applications are suitable for these quantum systems today. Um, so some of these verification problems are probably dependent on the type of problems you're trying to solve, right? So for example, if you're trying to do SMT solver, then you can think about verification but if I'm trying to run an ML inference, I'm not sure what verification means in that context. That's true. And in fact, yeah, that, so verification of the compiler is fine because we know how to do that, right? But verification of the algorithm or, or the implementation of the algorithm, that's quite difficult. In fact, another approach that I would advocate is that we're looking at is provably correct synthesis of an algorithm from its mathematical specification, mm -hmm. right? So proving equivalence of an algorithm specification and a, a program is definitely hard, right? Or proving that is correct. But proving that the transformations, once it's similar to this approach of, of an algorithm to an implementation are correct is probably easier. So I'm actually a big proponent of program synthesis as a method of getting verified Program. I see. So when you're talking about verification, you're talking about the middle layers, like compilers and translators and schedulers, not the uh, application itself. The... Well, we would like to verify the application, yeah. but I think that's a really hard problem. So I think a practical workaround are doing it layer by layer in this way. Right? Yeah, we haven't done that even for classical computers. So. Yeah. And this assumes that 
you know, you have an algorithm that is sort of mathematically proven to be correct, right? And then, and then you want an implementation that matches the algorithm. But I think a synthesis method along those approaches would, is probably the best way to go. So um, this brings up sort of my last point, which is, you know, I talked about this gap between algorithms and machines, right? And how to fill that gap. But there's sort of another interesting gap, which is between, you know, how should we design software in the short term? And how should we design software in the long term, right? And so right now we're looking at a lot of specialization and breaking abstraction to get the most out of these short-term machines of 100 to 1,000 qubits. Okay. How much of that will persist when we get to 100,000 or a million qubits and we get to fault-tolerant machines, right, that are much more reliable? Um, and that, you know, this is very much a similar evolution, right, in classical machines from the 1950s to now, right? Um, and so, you know, my intuition is actually that it's a little hard to imagine that a future in which qubits are really free, you know, they're always going to be somewhat expensive. And they're always probably going to have some degree of, of error and noise, right? And so I think that some of the things we do, is the, the, the most important things that we do right now will persist into the future, at least at the system sort of level software in terms of dealing with the physics of these machines. And in fact, even in classical machines, we now see some backsliding of abstraction because you know, we have uh, device variability and, and as things scale, right? And we have things like energy constraints. So, uh, but this is a really interesting uh, question because you know, 20 years ago, I was working on the right side of this before we had machines and at a very high level of abstraction. And you know, for the last you know, three years or five years, we've been working very much on the left side of this, right? And so the question is, where will this go in the next five to 10 years, right? Uh, but I will argue also that the work on the left is very important in the next five to 10 years to actually get us over sort of the valley of death for quantum machines, because we have to show that they can be useful in some way, even to get to the right side of this picture. Okay, so let me sum up, right? You know, I hope that I've conveyed some excitement that quantum computing here is at a really historic time, right? And, you know, really my main message that is that a computer systems view is really critical, you know, to get us to where we wanna be, to greatly accelerate the progress in this field, to get us to a practical point where we're actually able to compute useful things. And it's also the greatest shortage in the community and in industry to have people who are trained in this you know, vertically integrated way to really get these you know, really large efficiency gains that arguably are easier to do through software and co-design than by improving physical hardware, which of course also needs to happen, right? So um, you know, I went through a lot of this stuff today really quickly, but we have a very extensive website for Epic, which you can go to, um, which has all of these things that I talked about and more. Uh, as well as you know, tons of videos and tutorials and our textbook and a blog. So um, I hope this has uh, gotten you a little bit excited about this area. And uh, you know, I am happy to take questions and uh, today and you know, going into the future if, if this interests you.